This message is entitled, More Than I Can Handle. And I preach today from a heavy heart. One of our brothers in Christ is uh, going through a real tough time right now. A few years ago, he was diagnosed with cancer. And uh, he went through chemo treatment and then tested cancer free. A few months ago, he went in for testing and uh, the doctors found tumors all over. He went in for surgery and treatment a couple weeks ago. And the doctors found that it was worse than they expected. Uh, there were tumors everywhere. They removed some and they left some, feeling that if they removed them, it would be worse. He's still in the hospital. The doctors say that if he doesn't respond to treatment like they hope, he probably only has a year to live. And I love this guy. Only known him for about four months. Barely know him. But I love him. And, and he, he's a young guy. His wife. Two young children. What do you say? What do you, what do you tell him? What do you tell his wife? What do you tell his, what do you tell his kids? What do you say to a, a father of five who, whose wife was just killed in a car crash? What do you say to the little boy who has intestinal problems and has to walk around with the colostomy bag for the rest of his life? What do you say to the, to the parents whose daughter just committed suicide? To the parents whose child is in prison for life? To the person whose spouse filed for divorce? What do you tell them? What do you, what do you tell their, their families and their friends? As Bible-believing followers of Jesus, we say things like, God causes all things to work together for your good. We say things like, His thoughts and, and His ways are, are so much higher, so much better, and so much bigger than ours. We say things like, God is with you, and, and He is for you, and, and He loves you so much. He will never leave you or forsake you. He is, he's good and He has good plans for you. And that's all true. And in a perfect world, we respond to those truths and say, yes, amen, thank you. But if we could be real for a moment, if, if we could be honest, if we could be truthful, sometimes that's just not good enough. Like, like that doesn't take the pain away. That, that doesn't ease the suffering. That, that doesn't make things any easier. That doesn't bring back my loved one. It, it, it doesn't heal me. It doesn't help me. In fact, it kind of makes me angry. Yeah, God's real good to me while I'm laying up in this hospital bed. This is a, a real good plan He has for me while I'm burying my wife. I'm, I'm burying my child. I'm, I'm burying my sibling and my friend. I don't feel forsaken at all as I continue to cry out to him to deliver my relative from drugs or alcohol. But they continue to overdose. They continue to relapse. What do you say to that person? How do you, how do you respond to that person? Maybe you've been there. Maybe you are there. Maybe it's you. Here today... Or listening online, and you're you're crying out, and you're saying, "God, what are you doing? Why are you doing this? I I, I can't I can't take this. I, I can't do this. God, I don't I don't want this. This is this is too much. This is too much to handle. This is more." Then I can handle. I mean, if that's you, if that's someone in your life, 
then there are four things I need you to know, believe, and live that will comfort, encourage, and help you in those times of your life that are more than you can handle. Now listen to Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. For we do not want you to be unaware, brothers, of the affliction we experienced in Asia. For we were so utterly burdened beyond our strength that we despaired of life itself. Indeed, we felt that we have received the sentence of death. Now this is the Apostle Paul, the unashamed super-Christian, writer of like half the New Testament, who had a real-life encounter with the risen Christ and was radically converted. He's writing to a weak church in Corinth around 55 AD, and he's saying, look, I got to tell you, we just went through some stuff in Asia. Man, I thought we were going to die. It was way more than we could handle. And scholars don't really know what the affliction was that Paul was talking about. Some think it was a disease. Others think it was heavy persecution. But regardless of what it was, it was so heavy of a burden that he thought he was going to die. He thought it was over. He thought, this is it. I, I can't take this. It's more than I can handle. And this is what he wanted them to know. So the first thing you need to know is these situations that are more than you can handle in life, they will come. They, 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 they will come. These trials that bring about pain or suffering will come. These circumstances that bring about fear or, or worry will come. Seasons that are more than you can handle will come. You're, you're going to experience them. As a Christian, you're not exempt from them. This is one thing you, you need to know. Because a lot of people feel that because they are a Christian, because they read their Bible, go to church, pray, witness, and so on, that nothing hurtful, nothing painful, Nothing scary will come their way. And look, I get into my little bubble too sometimes where it's like, okay, I'm one of God's chosen people and he's been nothing but good to me since I've been saved. And I do this and I do that. And yeah, praise God. I'm safe from pain, sorrow and suffering. I'm, I'm safe from trials, trauma or tribulation. I'm safe from scares fears or tears and and that's just not true these things will happen you, you need to know that these trials will come loved ones will pass children will go astray parents will get divorced Test results will come back positive. Finances will go into the negative. Businesses, jobs, homes, vehicles, they will be lost. And I, I know that's hard to accept. I know we don't like it. I know we don't want to believe it. But it's, it's true. God's people are not all millionaires living in a mansion. On a, on a beach somewhere where their health is perfect, the weather is perfect, their life is perfect. It doesn't work like that. But some of us as believers and some of those as non-believers think that's the way it is. But it's not. Jesus said in John sixteen thirty three, I have said these things to you that in me you may have peace. In the world, you will have tribulation. You will experience pain and suffering. You will go through hurtful trials. But take heart. I have overcome the world. I love the end of that verse. But I don't love the beginning. I don't like that. I don't want that. 
There are things that could happen in my life that would just wreck me. Like Paul felt. Like, like you feel. Like your friend or loved one feels. One phone call. One, one text message. One email. But these things will come. You, you have to know that. You, you have to accept that. I don't want you to think that this life will be all kitty cats and rainbows. Not this life. The one to come, yes, but not this one. See, it's, it's important to know this because there are pastors out there that paint this picture that life with Jesus is just easy. That He's going to make all your dreams come true. And everything is just smiles and happiness. And they don't warn their flocks that pain and suffering is inevitable. It, it will happen. You're not exempt. And since they are unwarned, when it does happen, they blame God, curse Him out, and run away. And I cannot have that happen with any of you. Situations that are more than you can handle will come. God will give you more than you can handle. It, why? 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 Why do things like this happen? And, and you may ask, why is this happening to me, God? God, why? Let's look at verse 9 again. Verse 9. Indeed, we felt that we had received the sentence of death. But that was to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God, who raises the dead. Now, just from this verse alone, it seems like I could say, things like this happen, so you won't rely on yourselves, but on God. And that's a true statement. A lot of times, things do happen to make us look to Jesus. It's in times like these that we really seek after Him. It's in times like these that He's revealed all the more. It's in times like these that we experience firsthand His strength, His peace, His love, His provision, His mercy, His grace, and so forth. This is particularly true for non-believers. God allows scary and painful situations to come into their lives so they become aware of Him. He saves people through situations like this. Case in point. But what about our brother in the hospital? What about our single father of five? What about our kid with the colostomy bag? Their families? Their friends? What about the lady who's been a Christian for 70 years? Do we tell them, hey, this is all happening to make you rely more on God? Is it? Do we know that? I wouldn't be confident in saying that. I'm sure that's part of the reason, but who knows? We have no clue what God is up to. So we couldn't say that. Ecclesiastes 11.5 says this, As you do not know the way the Spirit comes into the bones in the womb of a woman with child, so you do not know the work of God who makes everything. You see, Paul realized that his particular situation was to make him rely on God and not himself. But that might not be true for your situation. You see, sometimes things happen to make us more patient. Sometimes things happen to make us love more or forgive. Sometimes things happen to make us more disciplined. Sometimes things happen to make those around us seek after Jesus. And the key word here is make. Paul says this happened to make us rely not on ourselves, but on God. Make us. Make us. Make us. Make us. Make us. Make us. Department stores have sales to make you want to come in and buy things. Construction workers on the highway set up roadblocks with signs to make you aware that they are working. Every so often Burger King releases the scent of their burgers into the air to make you hungry and want to come in and eat their burgers. If things are done to make us do something, 
or be something, then there has to be a maker of those things. So although I wouldn't be confident in answering for why God is doing what He's doing in your life, I would be confident in saying that He's the maker of that situation in your life. He, he ordained it. He orchestrated it. He's allowing it. Meaning what? The second thing you need to know when dealing with a situation that is more than you can handle. God is sovereign. He is in absolute control. And you can trust Him. Psalm 139.16 says, Your eyes saw my unformed substance. In your book were written, every one of them, the days that were formed for me, when as yet there were none of them. Now, the sovereignty of God is a message all by itself. We, we taught on it about a year ago, and for the sake of time, we can't teach on it again. So what I would do is refer listeners to listen to the message entitled, Has God Lost Control on the YouTube Channel? That message, message teaches the extent of God's sovereignty in depth. And let me tell you, it's more than you think. God is in more control than you think. What I will say briefly, for those that are here, is God's providence, which falls under His sovereignty, is, is mind-blowing. It's, it's amazing. I'll teach you three things. First thing, God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that He keeps them existing and maintaining the properties with which He created them. This is called providential preservation. Water stays wet. Rocks stay hard. Stars stay in the sky because, because God preserves them to be that way. Hebrews 1.3 says that Jesus is upholding, continually upholding the universe by the word of His power. Number two, God is, this is crazy, God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that He has a purpose in all that He does in the world and He providentially governs or directs all things in order that they accomplish His purpose. This is called providential government. Ephesians 1.11 says, God accomplishes all things according to the counsel of His will. And lastly, number three, God is continually involved with all created things in such a way that He cooperates with created things in every action, directing their distinctive properties to cause them to act as they do. This is called concurrence. And this is heavy stuff. If it's the first time you're hearing it, either your mind is spinning or you have no idea what I just said. That's why I encourage you to listen to the in-depth teaching we did entitled, Has God Lost Control? And I'm sure that's a question you ask when going through situations that are more than you can handle. Has God lost control? And the answer is no. God is in absolute control of absolutely everything, every yakta second of the day. Who knows what a yakta second is? Exactly. It's like the speed of light, the smallest second almost. Nothing happens that God reacts to as if He didn't know it was going to happen. So that situation in your life that is more than you can handle right now, you need to know that God is in complete control of it and you can trust him i don't know why it's happening it's safe to say that nobody does but there is a purpose we may not see it now we may not see it ever but there is a purpose and he knows exactly what he's doing i know it's hard to accept that something painful or scary that is happening in your life got allowed but I'd rather Him be in control than not. I'd rather Him be in control than you or me or, or anyone else. You need to know that He is sovereign. He is the maker of those situations. He has a purpose. 
He is in control. And there is so much comfort in that. Because He is good. He, he is love. He is with you and for you. And I know it's hard to believe right now. I know it hurts to believe right now. But it's true. It, that's truth. And you have to live truth. Moving on. Verse 10. He delivered us from such a deadly peril. And He will deliver us. On Him we have set our hope that He will deliver us again. Now here's where some preachers will say, as long as you have faith and trust in God, He'll deliver you from whatever. He will heal you from that disease. He will save you from that crisis. He will rescue you from debt. But that's just not true, really. I mean, God will deliver you the way He sees deliverance, but not always how we want. So I wouldn't be confident in saying that. For example, we had a brother, Don Lacerra, who was diagnosed with MS. And we prayed, and we prayed for God to heal him. But he passed. Or, God healed him. We saw deliverance as healing his body, but God saw deliverance as taking him home. So I can't give you a false hope and say, God will take away whatever it is you're asking for. I can't say God will take away your disease. I can't say God will rescue your business from bankruptcy. I can't say God will save you from divorce. Nobody can. He can. He can do it. He can do anything. But I, I can't say that He will. What I can say is He'll get you through it. The third thing I need you to know when dealing with a situation that is more than you can handle is God will get you through it. He will. And that in itself is deliverance. He will get you through it. And not only right now, as in this current situation, but always. Paul uses all three tenses here in verse 10. Past, present, and future. Paul says, hey, he got us through the deadly peril before. He delivered us then. Past tense. He will get us through this deadly peril. He will deliver us now. Present tense. And he will get us through future perils as well. On him, we have set our hope that he will deliver us again. Future tense. Isaiah 41.10 says, fear not. For I am with you. Be not dismayed. For I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. And essentially what, what Paul is doing here in these three verses is he's sharing personal experience. And nothing tops personal experience. Sometimes when you're with a person that is going through more than they can handle, it's best to just be with them. Just, just sit with them and be with them and love them. But if the opportunity presents itself, share how God has got you through a rough season like Paul is doing here. Remind yourself if it's you. Listen, three years ago, I lost my job. I lost my pension, my benefits, my car, my home. My so-called friends, my so-called life. I lost everything. I have nothing, worldly speaking. But look at me. Huh? Listen to me. Look what God has done. Look what God is still doing. Look how He's getting me through all that. Did I question and worry and doubt throughout most of it? Absolutely. Do I still? Of course. I'm of the flesh. But the whole time, He was in control and delivered me. And is delivering me. And will deliver me. And it is definitely more than I can handle. And if He did it for me, He'll do it for you. Because that's what He does. That's who He is. And you can trust Him. You can trust Him, family. Lastly, the fourth and final thing you need to know when dealing with a situation that is more than you can handle, is you have to pray. Verse 11, 
You also must help us by prayer, so that many will give thanks on our behalf for the blessing granted us through the prayers of many. Paul's telling the church to pray for him. And if he's asking the church to pray for him, then you best believe that he's praying as well. I mean, this is the guy who said in 1 Thessalonians 5.17 to pray without ceasing. You must pray. And by pray, I don't mean only ask God for things. Gimme, 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 gimme. Yes, we need things. Yes, ask Him for things. But it's not a, a business, sales, consumer relationship. It's a personal father-child relationship. Imagine if the only time your child, spouse, your friend came to you was when they needed something. Don't just come to God and say, give me this. Give me that. All right, now I need this. Okay, now I need that. Sit with him. Talk to him. Listen for him. It's fellowship. It's relationship. Just like I'm talking with you, talk with Him. Prayer brings us into deeper fellowship with God. And during those rough times, you need fellowship with God. You need to press into Him. You need to seek His face. Please do that. Please do that. Prayer is what you need when dealing with situations that are more than you can handle. Professor Bruce Waltke says he once rescued a bird from the claws of his cat. And though its wing was broken, the frightened bird struggled to escape his loving hands. Compare that with his daughter's trip to the doctor. Her strep throat means she needed to get a shot. Frightened, she cried. No, daddy. No, daddy. No, daddy. No. But the whole time, she gripped him tightly around his neck. Situations that are more than we can handle ought to make us more like the sick child than the hurt bird. So pray. Don't turn away. Don't run away. Don't hide away. Don't curse. Don't blame. Don't fight. Don't go wander. Don't go sin. Don't go silent. Pray. You need to pray and pray for one another. Paul asked the church to pray for him. Pray for each other. William Law says, there is nothing that makes us love a person so much as to pray for them. So you need to know that these situations that are more than you can handle will come. Okay. They will come. You are not exempt. And when they come, you need to know that God is sovereign. He is in control. You can trust Him. And when they come, you need to know that He will get you through it. All the time. And when they come, pray. And pray hard. Without ceasing. And pray for others. And have others pray for you. God responds to prayer. God acts from prayer. God moves by way of prayer. Prayer causes things to happen that wouldn't happen unless we prayed for them. There's your hope. There's your hope. As long as you have breath in your lungs, pray. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. James 5.16 There is no more perfect example in living these truths than the example we have in our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. God Himself, taking on human form, taking on our sins, our guilt, our shame. God the Father giving Him more than He could handle as a human. The Spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. Jesus, God Himself, Jesus, God Himself, was not exempt from pain and suffering. He wasn't exempt from hardship and affliction. 
He wasn't exempt from fearful circumstances or trials. It happened. As the perfect, sin-free, spotless Lamb of God was betrayed, beaten, and crucified. It happened. And God the Father was in control the entire time. Acts 2.23, Peter preaches and says, This Jesus delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God allowed it. He allowed it for a bigger purpose that His disciples couldn't see at the time. And that purpose being to save us sinners from the justifiable wrath of God. It happened. And God got Him through it. The Holy Spirit got Him through probably the worst Situation that any human being will ever go through. It happened. And Jesus prayed. He prayed in the garden. He prayed while hanging on the cross. He prayed right before he gave up his spirit. It happened. And God raised him from the dead. And now he's seated at his right hand. Still praying for you. And He will come again in glory. Amen. Bow your heads and close your eyes. Brother. Sister. I know you're going through a rough time right now. I know it hurts. I know you're scared. I know you're worried about your family. But I need you to know that you're not being punished. God is not mad at you. He's not out to get you. Trials like this happen. They come. They do. And I know that's hard to accept. And I wish I could tell you what God is doing, but I can't. But I do know that He is sovereign. I do know that He is in absolute control of absolutely everything. He is. And I know that's hard to believe, but you have to. And He will get you through this. He's gotten you through things in the past. He'll get you through this. And he'll get you through future trials as well. Because that's what he does. He never promised us an easy life. But he did promise to be with us throughout it all. Seek him. Follow him. Trust him. Let us pray. Lord, I come. I confess, bowing here, I find my rest. Without you, I fall apart. You're the one that guides my heart. And Lord, I need you. Yeah. Hey.
my sun to rise to you And when temptation comes my way When I cannot 